As a public relations professional, you should expect your employer or clients to trust you with sensitive information about their organizations. Your company's financial status, new product lines, media strategies, positioning relative to other companies, and other valuable information will necessarily come to your attention in the course of doing your job. Your responsibility to treat this information carefully and use it only as your employer directs you is not just good professional practice, it is a legally enforceable obligation. As a professional trusted with sensitive private information about your employer or client, you often will fall within a special kind of obligation known in the law as a fiduciary duty. This duty has a couple of different yet related elements. First, you are obligated to use your special skills, judgment, and knowledge of your employer or client's goals for the benefit of that employer or client. By paying your salary, giving you access to secret information, and typically providing you with the means to do your job, your employer is entitled to this kind of loyalty. Second, you have an obligation to use the information your employer gives you for the benefit of your employer or client. You have an obligation not to use the special information you have access to to benefit yourself at the expense of your employer or client, and to bring opportunities to the attention of your employer or client rather than hoarding those opportunities for yourself even though you only learned about them because of your job. The most common way of enforcing this obligation in court is your employment contract, which often will include detailed language about the loyalty you have agreed to give your employer or client. Breaching your employment contract not only can cost you your job and require you to pay damages to your now former employer, but it also can damage your professional reputation, potentially ending your career in the public relations professions. A more serious case, however, can emerge if you misuse information you acquire while working for a publicly traded company, that is, a company that sells shares of stock rather than being a small business owned by a few people. This kind of misconduct is called insider trading, and it can be punished by fines and prison sentences, depending on the details of the situation. Generally speaking, an insider is someone who has special access to information about a company. Insiders include the company's top executives and members of its board of directors, financial analysts who have detailed information about whether the company is profitable, top sales representatives because they often know important aspects of the company's strategy or upcoming products, outside experts who don't work for the company but are giving special access to information about it, employees working on creating new products that could greatly change the company's profitability, the company's public relations or investor relations employees who often are given a variety of private information about the company to devise strategies and represent the company more effectively, and anyone who receives insider information about the company from any of these people. In some ways, insider status is like a virus. It passes from person to person, changing anyone who receives the inside information into an insider. Insider trading, then, occurs when someone with access to this information, anyone the information reaches, no matter how far from the original source within the company, buys or sells stock based on this information. The magic words here are material and non-public. Insider information always is information that is not available to the general public. Material means the information must be important enough to influence an investor's decision about whether to invest in the company or the value of shares of stock held by current investors. Legal liability for insider trading attaches to everyone in the chain of disclosure of the information. From the person who originally revealed the insider information to the person who eventually traded stock based on that information, everyone involved in this high-stakes game of telephone is legally responsible for insider trading. That is because each person who received the information became, in the law's definition, an insider, with the same responsibility to protect the information as the original insider who first disclosed it. In a financial TV news report from 2010, a veteran Wall Street attorney discusses some examples of these principles in real life. 
The Wall Street community has been on pins and needles this week since reports of a broad federal insider trading investigation surfaced over the weekend. But what exactly is insider trading? The answer is not as clear-cut as you might think. Here to discuss, Robert Anello. He's a New York-based securities litigator who's done insider trading cases. You know, I used to think insider trading was like pornography. You knew it when you saw it. It was obvious. But as we're learning, that's not really the case. One thing that really struck me is there's no statute that defines insider trading exactly. And I don't think people understand that. It's all developed through case law. How are we supposed to know what's right or wrong if we don't know exactly what, what's, what you can and can't do here? Well, I, that, that is a problem in, in the uh, cases that are on the edge. There are some traditional cases where people obviously know what they're doing is insider trading, like an executive who buys or sells his own stock when he has information, or someone who steals information um, and, and misuses it. Um, but but there are many instances where, where you can't tell, um, at least from the statutes. You but can't. those are pretty clear-cut cases, the ones you just mentioned. The, what, what's freaking Wall Street out is a lot of behavior they've been engaging in for what looks like years. The government seems to be now trying to imply may not be so legal. So let me ask you a few instances, simple instances. Suppose uh, an analyst goes and stands out front of, of a parking lot of a company and counts the cars and makes some conclusion about how business is doing based upon how the traffic is. is could that be construed as insider trading? Or I, I, I don't see how that could be construed as insider trading. That's public information. Insider trading requires that it be material information, but also non-public information. And those are the two key words, material and non-public. That goes back right. to the 1933 Securities Act. I know that's the key thing. But let me ask you a couple of other situations. Suppose an analyst goes out interviews suppliers to a company and says how many are you supplying more widgets to this company or not and they provide some kind of information could that be considered insider trading again and that that's unlikely because the information that you're talking about there if it's if it's not information coming from the company and you have no reason to believe that that supplier is um, given any duty of confidentiality um, it, it unlikely that that would be perceived that's as insider interesting, trading. That's interesting, the duty of confidentiality. If there is some, it, could, a, could a, the government argue that they do have some duty of confidentiality? Well, the government could argue what they want, and they, they often would. But I, I think, the, the, as you said, there's no statute, but there is a body of case law out there. And the case law pretty much means, makes it clear that you either need some form of deception or some breach of an actual duty that exists, and you can't just make one up. Let me take it one level further. How about interviewing some employees, say you're going to a, a store and you're interviewing an employee at the store, whether a low-level employee or, 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 or not, you interview several of them, could that be considered low insider trading? Now, again, if the employee has some, has, is giving you information that, again, is non-public and which he or she is told he can't divulge, that would get you probably cr close to the line, if not over the line. But just asking an employee a question, I, I think that's good old-fashioned research. We've we got to go, but there is a misappropriation theory I know that's been developed here that says if somebody divulges something where they have an expectation of confidentiality, there could be some kind of violation of the duties at this point. Is, but, could the government argue that that's, in fact, the case here? If there is indeed a duty, they're going to have to do more than argue. They're going to have to establish a duty. And I think in many of these cases, that that's not the kind of uh, prosecution you're going to you handle a lot of these cases. Are you getting calls from clients? I, well, I, I don't want to talk about what. Certainly, the Wall Street is uh, is scared out there, and people are um, trying to find get advice as to how they should go forward. It's certainly a very interesting time, and certainly a very interesting time for you to be a securities lawyer. I appreciate you helping out, and Mr. Anello has uh, helped me a lot in the last few days trying to understand the intricacies of uh, securities law. Now, for a brief primer, Robert, thank you very much. Several practical steps can make it easier for you to uphold your duties regarding insider information to which you might be given access. First, it generally is advisable to avoid owning stock in your own company. Some publicly traded companies require this in your employment contract. You also might want to avoid owning shares in funds specific to your industry, since the value of stock in an entire industry often can fluctuate based on one company's actions. It also is essential that you be cognizant of what insider information is available to you. By doing this, you can remind yourself that whenever you use or talk about that information, you have especially strong legally enforceable duties. Small talk about your work, even with other employees, can be a perilous situation. Don't let the informality of the conversation lure you into disclosing information you have an obligation to protect. Even employees within the same company might not have access to the same inside information. 
Remember that inside information does not have to be information specific to your work within the company. As an employee, you have access to hallways, lunchrooms, break areas, patios, offices, and other areas within the company that are off-limits to the general public. Information you happen to encounter because of your position as an employee, even if that information doesn't directly relate to your job, can be inside information if it is material and non-public. Finally, beware information from other people about their companies that sounds like it could be material and non-public. You have a legal obligation not to buy or sell stock based on any inside information, not just information about your own company. Also remember that if someone discloses inside information to you, you become an insider to that company as well, and you have the same obligation as its employees not to pass on the information any further.